Hi everyone, Krista Cowan here with another episode of the Barefoot Genealogist. Today we are talking about personal history and how it relates to family history. We are well into the holiday season now and many of us will be spending time with our living family members through the season. So I just want to talk about some of the information that we can record for ourselves and our family members that will help capture some of that family history information for future generations and then just some tips about how and where to record that information. And if you are watching this on YouTube, I will have some links to some information that I'm going to talk about in the description on YouTube. Let's go ahead and dive in. I guess the first thing that I've been thinking about as I've been preparing for this topic is, what information do you wish your ancestors had recorded? If you could ask your you know, two times great grandmother anything, what would you want to ask her? And those are the kinds of things that I want you to start thinking about recording for yourself. Now I'm going to give you some ideas. It is certainly not an exhaustive list of ideas, but it's just maybe some things to prime the pump a little bit so that you can start thinking. Um, you know, things like, you know, your great grandmother may have crossed the ocean on an ocean liner or a passenger ship from, you know, somewhere in Europe to get to the United States at a time when there was great turmoil in the world. And maybe your life isn't like that, so there's not some question to answer about that. But think about why you want to ask, why you would want to ask those questions. What are you really trying to understand or know about her? And then are there things about your life that you would want your descendants, your children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren to know about you? Also keep in mind that some of the mundane things or seemingly mundane things uh, are also really interesting. I would love to know, for example, you know, what school was like for my great-great-grandfather or um, what his favorite book was. I would love to just know my own grandfather. He passed away before, long before I was born. Um, I would love to know his version of the story of how he met my grandmother. I've heard her version, but I never got to hear his side of the story. So there are a lot of things that we can think about. So I'll just share with you a few of them. Things like, where did you go to school? Did you get to go to school? Uh, if you had to drop out early, why? What were the family circumstances or life circumstances that required that? Um, how did you meet your spouse? I would love sometimes just a timeline of my ancestors' lives, things like the places that they've lived or the schools they attended or the jobs they held or a timeline of the memorable moments in their life in their handwriting and in their view. What did they consider memorable moments in their life? All of these simple, fantastical, whatever, anywhere on that spectrum, all of these are things that I would love to know about my ancestors. And they are things that I try to discover about them as I do my family history research. I'm not just looking for dates and, you know, birth dates and death dates and moving on to the next person in my tree. Very often I'm trying to dig into their lives and understand more about them. So uh, I think a lot about what it is that my descendants would want to know about me. What would my parents' descendants want to know about them? Or my grandparents' descendants want to know about them? And so I have come up with some ways to record that information. Uh, your history is family history. It's not your, I mean, it's, it's the history of your family, but it's, your family is a lot broader, I think, than sometimes we get so stuck uh, when we're doing genealogy research with the dead that we forget that there's the living. So I want you to start thinking about what you can do at some family gatherings that you might be coming up on here in the holiday season to start to record some of these family stories. Uh, one of my favorite things is to find an old family photo, uh, a photo from a family reunion or a photo from a, a holiday of some sort and share that with the family. Now, I did this a few weeks ago on Facebook. I took an old picture, it was of my grandfather, the one that I never knew, and his brother, who uh, was a little bit of a surrogate grandfather to me, and then his wife's um, brother-in-law. So it's my mom's dad and an uncle from each side of the family, and they were in this picture together. And it was the, the uncle that I was raised with. It was his 
hundredth birthday a few weeks ago. Now he's, he passed away many years ago, but I took that photo and I uploaded it to Facebook and I just shared, you know, happy birthday to Uncle Carl. He would have been a hundred years old today. And instantly family members started asking questions and sharing memories about this. Um, apparently it had been a Christmas or a Thanksgiving photo. So that's why the families were all together at my grandparents' home. You could see the side of my grandmother's face in the photo and somebody mentioned, I think the apron she was wearing. And then all of a sudden it came out that it wasn't really my uncle Carl's 100th birthday. Apparently uh, when he got married, his wife was six years older than him, I think, or four years older than him, and he didn't want to seem that much younger than her, so he'd split the difference between their age and he'd made himself a couple years older. Well, then when it came time for him to join the military in World War II, uh, he was born in a place where they didn't have birth certificates in Northwest Arkansas in the 19 teens and 20s, um, there, there were no, they didn't get birth certificates. And so his proof of his age was his marriage certificate. And so he joined the military with that age on his military paperwork. And then when he got home from the military, he used that information. And so this age just kept getting perpetuated that he had this birth year of 1916, when in fact he was born in 1918. Now I went back through my records because now all of a sudden the story's coming out from his children and his grandchildren and they're sharing it on Facebook and uh, checked and sure enough I found him in the 1920 census and he was only two years old. And I had just discounted that because every other record I had for him listed his birth date as 1916. And I just thought, oh, you know, they just didn't know. Well, it turns out they did know. That census, which was closest to his birth, was actually the only accurate record um, in his whole life about his age. But his children remembered this story, and so they shared it because I shared this photo. So that's what I'm going to encourage you to do. Uh, whether you do it on Facebook or whether you bring it out at the, you know, the dinner table at a family get-together, just find an old photo and share it and see what memories it starts to stir up for people. It's really kind of fabulous. Um, sorry for that noise. We just had a huge snowstorm last night and the snowplow just <laughs> went right, barreling right past the window. Um, so make sure that you write the information down or like in Facebook, capture it, maybe capture a screenshot of that information. I actually copied and pasted the comments from that into my Uncle Carl's profile on his ancestry tree, in my ancestry tree. So that now that information is captured, I have information about what his real birth date is, why all the records are wrong, um, and, and then a few, infor a few pieces of information about that photo and the events around that photo that I've also attached uh, in, the, in the tree to all of the people that are in that photo. It's a really great way to start to capture information before it's too late. If I hadn't shared that photo, if my Uncle Carl's children had passed away or his grandchildren who had heard the story, um, that information would have been totally lost or never captured um, again. So really great way to do that. We're such a photo-taking society now that sometimes it's easy to think, oh, well, there's pictures everywhere, but those historical family photos, even just from 20 or 30 years ago, uh, are rare. And a lot of times we only took pictures uh, at significant moments. The next suggestion that I have for you has to do with family heirlooms. Have you inherited any family heirlooms? Maybe you have your grandmother's gravy boat or um, an old piano or a set of silverware or whatever that, you know, maybe it's a picture frame or who knows, like there's a million things that get passed down in families. And my question is, uh, have you recorded the story of that heirloom? Do you know where it came from before you inherited it? Where did that person get it? Uh, and so start asking around if you don't know, start and then record that information. Now, one of the tricks that I use is take a photo of the item, whatever it might be, and then attach that photo in your online tree to the person who you received it from and include the little write-up about the provenance of that item and any memories that you have associated with it or its use. Um, my grandmother 
has a lot of really amazing things, but a couple of things uh, in her home that I love. One is this gigantic stuffing bowl um, that we use at holidays to make the dressing. Just this huge, huge bowl. And it sits high, high up on a shelf in her kitchen, and it sits there all year long, and then we bring it down for holidays. And I remember it sitting there my whole life in the kitchen. And so I once asked my aunt where it came from, and it turns out that my aunt bought it for her. Um, you know, so it's not an old heirloom, uh, but there has all already been a path determined for how that particular bowl is going to get passed along in the family. In my grandmother's dining room, she has this gorgeous um, crystal chandelier that hung in her mother-in-law's home that they built in Los Angeles in the 1920s. And um, my father has already expressed an interest in being the one that inherits that particular um, piece of furniture or you know, that heirloom. I have in my possession, my grandmother from the other side of the family, I have her silver and it's in this gorgeous wooden chest and she collected those pieces of silver, um, you know, sometimes one and two at a time as she could and I now have that in my possession. So if you've inherited any heirlooms, take a photo of them and then write up a little something about them so that you can preserve that history for people. Another thing you might want to do is think about interviewing family members. Now, I will provide links, um, but in the Ancestry Learning Center, there are a couple of articles that were written years ago that have some really great, um, you know, kind of prime the pump questions and, and starters. So this first article is about different interview questions, and that's all it is. It's just a list of questions that you can go through. And don't get overwhelmed. The purpose of this is not to be like, oh, I have something else to do. The purpose is to give you something to talk about when you're with your family, make sure you capture those memories and that information. Um, I've seen people use these interview questions at family dinners and reunions. You just write a question on a strip of paper or even just print this list out and cut it up. And then you fold those and stick them in a bowl in the middle of the table. And then somebody just draws a question and they answer it and then if people want to go around the table and have everybody answer it or if everybody wants to draw their own question a really good thing to do is just to turn on your recorder like on your phone or whatever digital recorder you have handy turn that on and record that conversation uh, because you will be amazed at the memories that start to come out and the information that starts to flow uh, and that's just a really really fun way to do that Another thing to do is to make sure that you capture the memories of those oldest family members. Make sure that their, their stories are not lost. So the other article that I will share in the links is um, some interview techniques to avoid. When you're dealing with um, older people, you have to think about things like you can't do too much at once. You don't want to ambush them, maybe prepare them that, you know, when I come in a couple of weeks, I would love to ask you some questions. And if you've got any old pictures you'd like to share, I'd love to see those. Um, there's lots of, um, uh, inf you know, lots of tips and information here in this particular article about how to capture that information, about how to elicit that information, even from people who sometimes are a little bit more hesitant to talk about themselves and the things that they remember. So I will include both of those articles in the link on YouTube. Then I would encourage you to make sure you record that information somewhere. And, key, and the best way to do it is to record it on your Ancestry online tree. In your online tree, one of the things that you can do is you can create stories for any person in your tree. And I would encourage you to do this even for yourself. So here, if I come into my tree, this is my profile in my tree. I've come here to the gallery. And over here, I can click on Add. And I can either upload a photo, upload a story, or create a story. So if I've already got this information like in a Word doc or something, I can just upload that story directly here. The other thing I can do is I can actually create a story. So I can come in here and I can say, I want to write a story. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a timeline of places I have lived. And that's going to be the name of my story. And then here in the body of this, I'm just going to go ahead, I already had this written so that I could just paste it. <laughs> um, I'm going to go ahead and just paste that. This is the little timeline of all the places that I have lived in my life. And I can add some additional information 
if I want here, I can attach this to other people. Um, in my case, because it's a timeline of the places I've lived, I probably don't want to do that. But if it was a story about something that had happened in the family and I wanted to include additional information, I could do that. And then I will go ahead and just click Save Story. And now I have this story here in the gallery that has to do with my life. Now, one of the things that people are sometimes concerned about is privacy. Just know that if anybody in your tree is marked as private, all of their personal information, including any of the information in that gallery, any photos or stories, is privatized, which means you as the tree owner are the only person who can see that information unless you specifically invite someone to your tree and give them access to see information about living people. Once that person passes away and you add the death date, and, and that's always a hard thing to do, especially when it's close family members, to go in and add that death date, it then opens up all of that information um, to, be, to be public if your tree is public. So I would encourage you to use the tools available on Ancestry, upload stories, upload photos, so that you've got that information. We, again, like I said, we spend so much time digging into the past and into the, you know, the people who are long gone, and that's amazing. I love doing that. I wouldn't have this job if I didn't. But sometimes in the process, we neglect the living history around us, our own history, the history of our parents and our aunts and uncles um, and the grandparents that we might have left. And so I want you to, to capture that information before it's too late. My last um, uh, tip here for you is, as it relates to things you can do. Uh, like I said, we live in a world now where people are taking pictures constantly, uh, and sometimes those pictures never make it off of our phones. But historically, even you know, just 20 or 30 years ago, we were really selective about the pictures that we took. And so uh, one of the things that I would encourage you to do is go through your old photo albums or those old shoe boxes full of photos, and maybe pick, pick out three to five pictures that best capture the life of your living family members. And then you can use your phone. You can actually, um, the Ancestry has an, a free app called the Ancestry Shoebox, where you can take a photo of the photo with your camera or with your um, smartphone or tablet, and then you can upload it directly to your online tree. I've used it in the past and it's super slick. Um, but that allows you to take some of those photos that you may not have scanned or digitized yet and just upload them directly to your tree and attach them to the people in your tree that they belong to, again, so that we're capturing the memories and the information about those living family members. Let me just wrap up by just saying I don't want you to get overwhelmed. <laughs> the point of this is not to get everybody to do everything, but to, to get everybody to do something to preserve your personal and living family history. So maybe pick one or two of these things to do with your family this holiday season. Um, don't neglect the questions um, and specifically those oldest family members that sometimes we only see at holiday time uh, that might not be with us the next holiday time and make sure that you uh, at the very least are able to talk to them. And then I encourage you to share this information with your living family members. Uh, sometimes when I talk to my brothers and sisters and my nieces and nephews about the ancestors, their eyes glaze over really quickly. But when I can tell them stories about, you know, when their dad was a little boy and how, you know, he would get in trouble and we'd stick him in time out in the corner and he'd fall asleep because he stopped moving. <laughs> or when I can tell them stories about how their grandparents met and fell in love because I've heard that story multiple times throughout my life. And I wanna make sure that, that my nieces and nephews know that story. Um, and, and it's even more fun when I tell it when my parents are in the room because then my parents correct me <laughs> and, and sometimes their perspective on the story is a little bit different from mine and it's different from each other's. And so it kind of rounds out that information and it gets us sharing as a family. And so make sure you share that information with your living family members. You can also share your tree with your living family members. You may be the only person working on the genealogy, but you can share your ancestry family tree with anyone in your family, and they do not have to have an ancestry subscription. I can share it with my brother and my sister and my parents and my nephew, every one of them, 
can access my family tree and they don't have to have a subscription to Ancestry to see the information that I've uploaded, the stories and the pictures and, um, and all the information about the living family members if I give them that access. So I would encourage you to do that. Uh, it's, one, it's a great way to get people involved in family history, but it's also a great way to connect families. And ultimately for me, that's what family history is all about, is connecting our families. Until next time, this is Krista Cowan. Have fun climbing your family tree.